This episode is brought to you by Kanye West and his inspirational quote, Lord, please let them accept the things they can't change and pray that all of their pain be champagne. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hello, my people! ¿Cómo están, damas y caballeros? Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversations. This episode was the bomb and has been in the works for months now. Max Rangel is the CEO and global president of Spinmaster Corp, a leading global children's entertainment company with over 1,800 employees in 28 offices globally. Spinmaster is best known for award-winning brands like Paw Patrol, Bakugan, Kinetic Sand, Air Hogs, Hatchimals, Gund, and others, and distributes products in more than 100 countries, my friends. Born in Lima, Peru, Max is a results-driven global C-suite executive with 30 years in CPG with Procter & Gamble, Hershey, S.C. Johnson & Sons, and now Spin Master. Max's career has spanned operating roles in North America, Latin America, Asia, Middle East, and Europe. Name this is like this is crazy. Look at all the countries he's lived in. So in order: Peru, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Colombia, the U.S., Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and now Toronto, Canada. <laughs> What really excited me about this episode, apart from meeting Max and Max being a Latino, which I'm so excited about, is speaking to such a kind, down-to-earth, high performer. Like, you'll tell by his voice and, 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 and the content, he really cares. It's incredible. Max really gave us a behind-the-scenes look of what it takes to achieve considerable professional success but most importantly, how to do it without losing sight of what actually really matters in life, family, relationships, and your own mental and physical well-being. I can't put my excitement into words. This was a magisterial episode. Today, you'll get to know the Max, the, the, the incredible human being behind the CEO that everyone knows. You'll get to really know Max the person, an incredible human being, my friends. Enjoy this episode like I know you will in three, two, one, go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Stefan Dyer podcast. I have here the legend, the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable Max Rangel. Como estas? How are you, my friend? Hola, Stefan. ¿Qué tal? Todo super bien. Thank you very much for making yourself available. We started talking uh, months ago and, and we've been briefly talking. So I'm so happy that, that we were able to, to fix a date and that you were able to just take some time from, from your busy schedule. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm very excited for, for today. How have been your first months in, in Canada, your first year in Canada? My fr uh, so I've been in Canada since the end of January. So I came um, obviously uh, in the winter and uh, I've lived in cold places before in my career and in my life. And so the good news is that uh, Canada is a beautiful place in the winter. So that was my first, you know, amazing realization. What a beautiful place it is. I've been to Canada many times before in, in different cities, including Toronto. Uh, but for some reason, I was always in Montreal for winters which was, you know, obviously a high bar from the amount of snow and, 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 the, and how cold it is. Yes. Um, so when I, when I came to Toronto, the first wonderful realization is, is like, it's not as cold. So yeah. I was very excited about that. And I measured that by getting out and how many layers I do when I go out for a quick run. And so the fact that I was able to not have to buy new layers because <laughs> I had the ones that I needed, uh, it was perfect. So I was very excited about that. Um, the people I had met before in my in my life, and it was just confirmatory how great you know Canadians are, and so that's been a terrific thing. But I have to tell you, there's been one amazing finding, and that is 
how awesome the food is in Toronto. Yes. We were locked down or staying at home. I discovered prepared food in Toronto and I am in love. And so uh, you can eat so well in the city, as you as you know, because you've yeah. lived here longer than I have. Uh, and that's been great. Uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're very happy in Toronto and uh, we can't wait for it to reopen more, which we're about to see. I totally agree. This is a very diverse, multicultural city. I know you've you've lived in the U.S. I think the only other city in the U.S. that is as multicultural, I may be wrong, but it, I think New York and Toronto are up there in, in the world rankings of diversity and, and inclusion and multicultural. Uh, it's it's fantastic. So one of the one of the traditions on the podcast is I tell my guests why I invited them. And I've had athletes, uh, business people, uh, rappers, and like from all realms of, of the world and nationalities. And in this case, I am surprised, amazed and proud. First of all, that, that you're a Latino, you've accomplished so much in the world and in the business world. As Tony Robbins says, success leaves clues. And I think a lot of us have to learn so much from you. Not only have you accomplished a lot in the, in the business world, but you've lived in Peru, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Colombia, the US, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and Canada. This is insane. You're, you're a nomad. As I was telling you, I've lived in, I thought I was a nomad. I've lived in Peru, where my parents are from, very similar to you because you were born there. Then I was I was born in Costa Rica. Then I moved to El Salvador, Mexico, Montreal, and Toronto. So very similar. I, I you have a striking resemblance. I don't know if some somebody has ever told you, but there's a Walking Dead actor called John Bernthal. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who this guy is? Yes. Um, someone just told me that recently. Um, yeah. But they, they went on to tell me that the reason that I should remember him is because he is the Punisher. So <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't sure if the person was telling me of my resemblance because I'm a Punisher or because I really <laughs> physically look like him. So uh, but I took it well. So uh, my uh, one of the things I have to do is basically load up a few episodes uh, on Netflix and, and start to watch him. So, uh, yeah. He's also the guy who sells the pen on uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, know. my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's there. He's an incredible act. Also, maybe you resemble because of the incredible uh, sales and influencing capabilities from that <laughs> scene. <laughs> so I know you lived in Peru and Venezuela. My wife is from Venezuela. I'm Peruvian, even though I wasn't born there. My entire family is from there. What do you miss the most about Peru and Venezuela? I, I would tell you that um, from Peru, besides my family, I'm very, you know, family oriented. Uh, and I still, I still have a few, you know, family members back in, in Lima. Uh, the food, right? It's yes. hard not to say that you miss the food. Um, and then from Venezuela, um, besides my friends, because I don't have enough family in Venezuela, there are two things that actually I, I really miss. But I actually have the treat to enjoy still while not in Caracas. So one is the people and how amazingly friendly and fun-loving they are. Yes. Uh, the fun-loving nature of a Venezuelan is A, contagious. It makes you a better person. It makes you laugh more. Laughing is a good thing. Uh, and I'm always constantly uh, being told to laugh more because I'm very serious. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I always surrounded myself with as many Venezuelans as I possibly could. I was always laughing. And, and um, honestly, the topography. So Caracas being, you know, as high up as it is, uh, it affords to a lot of things. And I love El Avila. Uh, one of the things that, I, yeah. that my wife and I, I have. I have it right here. My wife yeah. for El Avila. I have my Avila too. We all have the Avila. Once you live in Caracas, you, 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 and I used to live, and every morning I would look at the Avila. Every morning from my place, I would have a live view. And, and every weekend, I would go to El Avila to basically to climb um, or to run or to do whatever. So uh, those are the two things that I actually would miss the most. I, I love that. How many years did you live in Caracas? I was in Caracas for um, four years. Four years. Yeah, that's, that's enough to really be immersed with the culture and, and 
and love it definitely by you saying that you climb the lari lap i heard in other interviews that you've done that you are a big sports competitive and that you played for you played water polo on the national team and i really think being i'm a big sports guy too i really think being competitive on the sports field is kind of like a transferable skill into the workplace into your professional life do you agree have you taken that aspect into your professional life yes i i have um And there are people who are quietly competitive and there are people who are outwardly competitive. And and I think I've learned over time that you have to sort of tailor your competitiveness depending on the situation. And, uh, you know, when you're younger and ambitious and want to be known, you're sort of outwardly and uh, annoyingly competitive (laughs) and people sort of kind of know about it. But as you grow an influence and you have to respect, you know, differences and build inclusion, Uh, and different people for what they bring to the table have to basically behave differently. You have to be every now and then quietly competitive. And, uh, and luckily I've learned to, uh, to do both. Yeah. I think it's very good to be self-aware of your communication style. And I really think that nothing is an asset or a weakness it's just context, like uh, being super like loud and competitive. It could be an incredible asset on the field, but it could maybe be a weakness or be perceived negatively in some aspects of a, of the workplace. So having that self-awareness is, is huge. I, it seems to me by reading your, your bio and your LinkedIn profile and everything you've accomplished that you've been really authentic, in, in, intentional about your career. And I'm really interested in, in the art of building relationships, not in a disingenuous way, but more like an authentic way. I think that at your level, building strategic long-term relationships can have an enormous impact on the company that you're leading. It can, it can mean millions of dollars. It can mean a really good client. It can mean really good relationships with your executive team. Um, when it comes to networking or building really good relationships, do you have any tips on, or how do you approach it? Have you read any books? What can you recommend for people, especially people who are introverts, maybe? Yeah, um, I am forever grateful to my dad for instilling in me the desire to know the people that you are working with closest, to be kind to the people that you're working with, and to get to know a little bit about them and to always want to learn something from them. Because when you want to learn something from someone, you have to acknowledge this person does something that I don't do well today. And it could be on any, it, it doesn't have to be professional. This person could be, you know, a great person who balances, you know, work and life. This person could be, and I've actually looked up to people who actually correct their children's behavior in a way that I would I was not good at. Right. Because I was more like, you know, being competitive and being, you know, or, you know, you want to just correct and be be harsh. And and I saw people who would just do it so brilliantly and in a disarming way with no inflection to connote they were upset, correct behaviors because they were reinforcing and they were respectful, even though it's parent to child. So even to that degree, I will always try to learn something from someone. And, and my dad taught me that. I, I remember he um, when we moved from Caracas to San Juan, he was basically still building uh, back in Venezuela, and he was developing in Puerto Ordaz. So we would fly to Maiquetilla and then to Puerto Ordaz. I was young. I was a very young you know, child. And during summers, between school breaks, I would go work with him. And when, when I say work with him, I was just kind of following him. So I was not really doing any work, just to be clear. Uh, but you know, he would go and pick up the people that would basically work with him. He would go to their homes. And, and, and so that's when I learned that, you know, when you work with people, you have to truly try to find the time to, to be with them and to find something that, you, that, you, that makes you connect. Why? Because I think we're in the business of human connection. I think even at work, you know, you're connecting with, with people. And the more that you try to do that, the better off you are. And Stefan, I think, you know, in, in the spirit of your vulnerable conversation, it's really difficult uh, these days through just tiles and Zoom. And it's while doable, uh, 
to me, something that I have to work extra hard because I did it so many years the other way, which is just face to face. Yes. So uh, honestly, it's a, it's a wonderful skill to keep a, a, you know building going forward. You know, most enterprises and and um, and businesses are returning to work in hybrid modes, and this is here to stay. So we just have to, you know, upskill ourselves and get better at it. Definitely. that I agree with you. There's a quote that I really like that is relationships move at the speed of vulnerability and vulnerability builds trust. And I think that connects really well with, with your dad actually caring. Like there's a lot of people who are very talented and smart, but if you don't care, it's going to be really hard to influence people because you, you need to care. I, I think yeah. from, from seeing what you've accomplished and speaking with you, Previously, I can tell that you actually care. And that's why I think you, you have been really, apart from many other things that you can't just care and not be really good at the technical things, you know, but it, it really goes a long way. From For the people who are starting their career, I'm really interested if you have an advice for 18-year-olds, 23-year-olds graduating out of university, mainly what advice would you give to them in in 2021, but also what advice would you give yourself if you were starting your career all over again? You know, I, so, so it's a very relevant question because I have, you know, I have children who are beginning their careers. They're 21, 23 um, or older, 28, our oldest daughter. And, and, you know, my, my, my advice to them, my advice is twofold. One is for them, they have to reach out. They they have to reach out. They are not just simply going to stumble on this. You have to work on it. It does not happen by accident. Yes, there will be a chance encounter. And those, you would say, great, be grateful for it. But by and large, you have to spend the time. And that means you have to reach out, be vulnerable, and be willing to be rejected. And that's the simplest hardest thing to learn how to do you will likely be rejected because we live busy lives and who is this kid you know and who and why is he doing this what is in the end what he's looking to gain out of it so you have to second besides being you know acknowledging that you will fail the second is to be clear why you're doing this just like you were clear as to why you wanted me to come and spend time with you you have to be clear as to why you chose that person so you have to do a little bit of research you know, the days of the happy stance, everything happens easily, I think are completely done. And then third, you have to reach out to your family, friends, and other colleagues or friends and leverage your network. Yeah. Because I think people by and large are well-intended. You have to believe that. You have to be optimistic. I'm a glass half full, so I'm going to be optimistic. And we've always, we've been there. So why can we not pay it forward and just go spend time with them? Uh, and so I'm always game for it. Now, once you've done that and established that connection and been vulner vulnerable to be rejected, now you have this encounter. So what do you do about it? Well, you have to make it worthwhile for the other person too. That's my opinion. So I actually suggest that you would almost reverse mentor. So you're looking for mentorship. What do you bring to offer? And what you bring to offer to someone who's not a millennial or not someone who's now basically living different realities is, you know, to offer that point of view in a sincere, your way. So, you know, it's like sometimes people hear about this generation being very fickle and being incredibly disloyal. So rather than saying, I'm not loyal, I'm fickle, just say what's important to you. Because yes. I see someone with more experience, insights from a real person in the age group. So I, I, I believe this is a give and take. To a young person, I would say, you must take the initiative. You have to work on it. And once you start, you have to start giving back. I love that. I think you have to put yourself on the spot. I agree. When I look back at some of the most <laughs> influential or, or decisive moments of my life, yeah, I get, I'm only 33, but <laughs> I still look back. I did an internship at, at CIBC in 2009. And Everything was incredible, but one thing said, you're not proactive, like a small comment, and it hurt me. What? Me? And I was like so angry, but then I did something about it. 
if it, it, it's incredible self-awareness. Sometimes you have these blind spots that you can't really tell. And I, I, I'm a big believer that I love to study high performers and that's why I'm really excited to talk to you. But from, from my research and from what I've read, it's that people who have accomplished incredible things do it by doubling down on their strengths, not necessarily mitigating their weaknesses. But if you, if you don't mitigate like a very key weakness, you may never even get to a, a specific level. So I do agree with you that you need to put yourself on the spot and you're going to learn incredible things. Apart from being really good at, at what you do, so being really good at the technical work and in your, in your job, what would you say is the most important thing for someone to make it to the executive level, to, to SVP, to EVP, to, to CEO? Do you think if we had to point at one thing, would it be being able to manage people, speaking with confidence, influencing people, building relationships, staying late? What, what would, if you had to point at one thing, apart from being really good at the, at the task at hand, what would, what, what would that be? I think you have to lead. The more you grow, the more you must lead. And leadership is uh, obviously very important. It's something that can be learned, but it's something that has to be intentional. So as you move levels, you basically find yourself now leading more people because as you grow, you can't do everything yourself. As you may have done one day as an individual contributor or a manager of a smaller group, a, sm a smaller group affords you potentially to someone with a lot of capacity for that person to be very hands-on, okay? But then you move up a level and you went from having four people to having 12 people, okay? And there is simply humanly an impossibility about managing everything that everyone's managing to the degree that you have done before. So oftentimes it's about leadership and recognizing that the success you had leading to where you had been may have to now change and you have to adapt and you have to lead potentially very differently. And learning that, accepting that, and wanting to do something about it, oftentimes for me is a difference between people who grow leading in a new level and succeed versus those who are still in a previous level operating in a new executive position. Uh, and it's a, it's a fine line, but one that people have to come to grips with, accept and move forward. Yeah, I agree. I heard once that what got you to the party is not what's going to keep you at the party. So yes. that jump from leading four people to leading 12 or maybe leading 50, it's a, it's a huge change. Is there anything like any book that you have read on, on leading or any course that you took or it's, is it literally experience? I think it's a combination of not just leadership books, but also like behavior, because I believe that a lot of these requires behavioral changes. I can say something that sounds good if I don't practice it because I haven't behaved differently and behaved enough, then it will be really difficult to do it naturally. So, yeah. so what happens is that, you know, we all are built one way and our reflexes will basically lead us in a particular direction. Unless you start behaving differently then, and do it often and do it consistently, you really haven't changed. And so uh, Kobe is a great book. I mean, seven. Half, I mean, that's a massively great foundational book that you Which read. One, sorry, uh, Stephen Covey's book. Okay. Yeah, habits of uh, highly effective people. So, I think you read that book and you take a pause and you reread the book a few years later, and you you would find paragraphs and you would find things that you did not pay attention the first time around, because in your leadership journey, that may have not been as salient a point. But as you grow, you would now read the same paragraph with experiences that allow you to consume the material differently, in my opinion, and that's been my, my, uh, you know, my journey so far. So I love that, 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 that book, as well as I do love books of people that I've worked with, because you can relate a point to what that person did. So in my career, I've had a lot of leaders who obviously have been very successful. And they've gone on to write, to write books. And that's just, you know, luck. Is there any, any specific book of someone you've worked with that you can recommend? I love um, 
one of the leaders when I joined PNG that was at the helm, John Pepper. And, and John Pepper had so many foundational learnings for how I lead today. That is one of the people who I absolutely revere, admire, and, and truly, you know, came to learn a lot from just from afar because I did not report to him. But he was that far reaching and that sound in what he actually said because it was what he practiced. So when you nice. when I read the book and I saw that and you're, you're looking at it from a distance, then I worked for people that worked for him. And it all was real. There was no BS. It was the real deal. And so you know that you admire that you practice it and you behave differently. And suddenly you're now impacting people. And because you knew how it felt, yes. all you can assume is, you know, I'm impacting people and, and this is great. I'm engaging people in a way that I want to. In many ways, it's become their legacy because their it's message like lives on. As a, as a, on, on the topic of high performers and leaders and you being competitive and a sports fan, is there any athlete that you really admire? Oh, there are many athletes I admire. Um, and, and you admire them for, for what they've done for the, for the sport, but also what they've done for, you know, what they leave behind as a legacy. You know, I, I love Carl Ripken, for example. Yeah, you know, and and I like I grew up in a in a town that revere baseball. Uh, so and every time I would watch him play, and every time I would actually see him, you know, perform. And when I watch him when he interviewed, and when I saw what he did, um, it was like so confirmatory that the person that you see is a person that actually is giving back to the community and building a legacy. Uh, you know, That's I like sweet. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is a an amazing athlete that is so much for the sport and. And it's controversial because a lot of people had so many things to say about, you know, how he behaved and how he drove his team and his teammates. Did but you watch The Last Dance? I did. Oh, so good. So good. Is there oh, any no. sp specific moment that you love the most or that you kind of relate as a leader? I never knew until I watched The Last Dance that he had this like, you ruin this game for us. I'm coming after you the next game. <laughs> He took it personal. Yeah, he took it. But you know what, Stefan? I am a huge believer in passion. So when you when you ask a question in a business meeting, in a business setting, and you get an answer, the degree to the answer reflects the passion of the person who is really loving her job or his job and is getting into it and truly, you know, rolling up her sleeves and getting into the details. They respond with facts, passion, conviction. Uh, and leave it all on the tracks. And yeah. that, to me, that's what he was. You know, he, he just left it all on the court. And uh, and and there's one more thing which I admire, which is obviously the fact that he stayed with the sport. Right? It wasn't just it wasn't just a means to all his championships, but he's now an owner. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, Charlotte. <laughs> the most disarming moment to me of that a documentary was when he said they were criticizing him about being like very intense and, and sometimes allegedly mean to his teammates. And the most disarming was when he said, that's easy for you to say, you've never won anything. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> how disarming would that be if he told that to, to you or to me? You couldn't yeah. say anything. The guy has six rings. He's one of the best ever. In incredible. It also like, tells you that you can't be everything to everyone. Right. Yeah. So you have to be yourself and those who come along. Great. And those who don't, you try your best. And if they don't come along, if it's on a business that you're in, they may not need to be on your team. And that's OK. You know, it's not for everyone. So it's okay. Abs to absolutely. Another quote that I love by Naval. He has a, an, a podcast. It's called Naval, but incredible source of, of how, how to be happy, how to be wealthy in, in many areas of life. And he has this quote, escape competition through authenticity. And to me, it, it, it really ties to what you just said. Some people will come for the ride, some won't, but you have to continue to be yourself. And I think that's how you'll escape competition because nobody can beat you at being you. Now, it's it's hard to to get to be you all the time in every setting it takes time and it takes practice but i think it's it's key at your level and after so many years of of being in the professional world and accomplishing stuff how do you deal with stress and conflict and so many people 
depending on you or, or reporting to you. And what I mean by that is, how do you unwind? How do you achieve mental clarity, which is a, a big a big part in being productive? Do you meditate? Do you do sports? Do you, uh, what do you do? I'm really interested on, on that part. Yeah. Um, to me, it's really about, for what, what works for me is physicality. So endorphins. And, uh, and it just may be my upbringing and it may be what I was always exposed to. But, you know, typically, um, when, when, I, when I'm quarantining, which is, which, which is really difficult, right? And I'm, you know, I have to do it. And I, I think I've done it like three times or two times. I have to find ways to do that. So I have my routine. I have all the tools. Because if I wouldn't do that, I would be miserable. So for me, it is... And so, and so, you know, I have, trust me, I can be very active, even if you are quarantined. And if you're quarantined in a thousand square feet, I can be just as active. So yeah. You, you do is you learn. So I think conditioning is such a thing that, you know, you have to work, find what works for you. The second thing, which is really, a, honestly, it's been taught to me by, by my daughter. I'm not very good at it. And I should do more of it is breathing. Mm -hmm. So. I think there is an amazing um, benefit to breath work. And, uh, and she, she does this three times a week uh, and teaches and, and everything. And I wish I could do more, but- This is your the, daughter? Yeah, our daughter Jackie is uh, a breath work instructor. And uh, oh. what you get out of it is simply fascinating. So the oxygenation that happens clears you, but you really take it for granted and you don't do it. Yes. And, and so to me, I would tell you the combination of those two things is really, really helpful. And then I think, Stefan, I have um, an amazing voice of reason uh, that I always go to. And there's one or two people that I do that with. And so when in doubt and when or in stress, I just basically, you know, being in Toronto, one of the things I've loved the most too, I didn't say that is I love the walking culture. So yeah. Everyone goes walking and I think it's terrific. And so if I ever get into that point, I just go for a walk and I get my voice of reason to come with me and it works. So that's the way I'm coping right now. And I, and I think, uh, you know, you have to find these things because you ultimately, um, it gets lonelier, right? Definitely. It's just it gets lonelier. So you have to have these, these, these ways to over overcompensate. During the pandemic, while it's been very challenging, one of the most positive things is the same walking. Um, my wife and I, we don't, we can't really go out because we're still in lockdown, but we just go around the block, take a walk. And it's really beautiful because you, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, no, no. How are you? Tell me, I want to know about your day. Cause if not, it's just like, no, no, I'm okay. No, no, no. but I I'm really interested but the walk, because there's a path and you have to go around it to come back, it really sets the tone. You have to talk and you can really get to listen to the other person and listen to how is your day. And then you actually get to plan. What do you want to do? What do you want to do on the weekend? Where, where, where do we want to travel once this thing is, 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 is done? You know, so again, relationships move at the speed of vulnerability. You can't really be vulnerable if you're always in a hurry. Yeah. So it's it's really it's really good to have that space. I I actually I, I like I like to play games too. Um I, I think uh you know I'm I'm incredibly lucky that I, I get to do that now more um because of where I'm working at, uh, which is an it's a great place. Yes. But I, I have to tell you, um I love to play backgammon. And I so, grew up playing backgammon, I love and, it. And I, honestly, my wife and I made the choice to get a backgammon set that wouldn't be hidden away in a in a drawer. Because like anything in life, if you see it, you just might use it. Yeah. And so for us, it's really a great outlet to, you know, to have a conversation. When you're not walking and you just want to be home, you just open it. We're both ultra competitive. So, you know, we're we're still competing. You know, you're you're not you're not endorphins are expressed differently. Um, definitely but it's really fun and uh you you kind of know when you need to go on to do something else when the game's not done and they just shut the board down because you know they don't want to lose <laughs> yeah 
oh, you you get your emotional intelligence from the you know from the cues of a game. But it's uh, gaming is is great. And a lot of game theory, really, for business is learned in games through games. You don't need yes. to go. I, I studied finance and economics at, at the University of Toronto, and I took a game theory class, which was the hardest of my life. But really, when you think of it, like like the principal agent, the principal agent theory, the Pareto optimal, all these little things you learn playing backgammon, playing risk, playing all these board games, Monopoly, all these things. And, and growing up in Latin America, you, you go and play in, in the neighborhood with other kids running outside. And a lot of these lessons you also learn there. Now that, that, now that you're a spin master and you, you're immersed in games, you can put it into practice. Yeah, we, we got to send you some headbands and a few other games that we'll make sure you you uh, you get from us. But I've discovered some new titles that are amazing, and uh, and you know what it, what what they do, um, which is really cool, is you are vulnerable in playing some of these games because your verbal acuity or how good you are with you know trivia uh, facts is not as developed as your opponent or your friends. And who, no one ever wants to just admittedly lose. No one <laughs> yeah. ever wants to admittedly know that you are not good at trivia or that you know you don't know who this person is. Yeah. So I think it's a it's a fun thing to just honestly decompress, de-stress, um, and utter a smile. So you learn a lot about yourself too. It, it's you it's really good. I think a lot of people talk about peace of mind, but I think what a lot of us want is peace from mind. And, and we want to, in the game, you're not thinking about work or the market or you're, you're, you want to win this game, especially if you're competitive like you and I. So you have that piece because you're just thinking about what you're doing and you're mindful, you're present. And it's like the same as, as surfing. You're, you're just surfing soccer. You're just playing soccer. So I think that's why a lot of us enjoy it. We're gonna get you into into puzzles too, by the way. So we have some really wonderful puzzles that I've been doing. I, I was not a big puzzle person before, uh, but I've enjoyed more and more doing puzzles, and they're incredibly calming. And uh, and if you have a bit of competitive in you, you just don't want to see it undone. Like, <laughs> yeah, like that. You got you got to keep going because you know you want to see the finished product, and so uh, it's so fun. So anyway, definitely. Um... What what does your as a high performer? What does your morning look like? Do you have any rituals, habits, productivity hacks that you can share? Because the opportunity cost for you as a CEO, as, as the global president of Spin Master, sometimes it's it's very high because one hour could mean a, like one hour of your time can mean a lot. But how um, your morning is especially to a lot of high performers, CEOs, and uh, even competitive people, I'm really interested. Do you have any rules, rituals, hacks that you always follow in your morning? What does that look like? You have you have to pay yourself before you pay others. Oh, so to be, good. To, to be at your best, you have to feel yourself. So listen, I, I think this week I've had a couple of days where I was just going, you know, pedal to the metal, you know, 11.30, midnight, you get back, you go to sleep. And I always, when I go to sleep, I always looked up to what's the morning like. And so, and oftentimes everyone's different. You know, I could be where I had three tasks and I have to get them done. And I have a choice to do them at night or in the morning. I'm a, I'm a morning person. So Same. the first thing I do is, you know, if I'm in a city that I'm not, you know, I don't live in that city, I get out. To the city because I'm all I'm also very stimulated and you don't never get to know the city unless you're cycling running or walking the city in my opinion so good. In car, so good. now they even more you're basically paying attention to your phone right or you're distracted by all the views if you are on foot or on a bike you need to know when you need to turn so if I'm in New York and I'm you know and I have a meeting at nine then I'm going to be out by 5.45 and I'm going to go cycle for an hour. And I have these, uh, and I have over time developed these things that just, they are highs. So seeing Central Park oxygenates me. I don't know yeah. why it happens, but when you enter the park, you, you could be tired 
as you know, physically you're being told by your computer, you need to recover. And you see central part and then your fuel gauge just recovers. So these are there are things that are just emotional that fuel me and that's incredible. If you're in the city and you're gonna go out to the West Highway and you are by Hudson River, you're gonna see the water. Water oxygenates me. You know, if I'm in Toronto, I try to go all the way down to the water and walk the waterway because it gives me fuel. So for me, it's about paying yourself before you pay pay it to the organization so that you can be at your best. De- definitely. I, I I really agree. I think it's the same as going into Central Park or, or High Park here in Toronto or, or the water. It's very similar to maybe being at the beach and it's you can't do anything but what you're doing. If you're at the park, you only see the park and you're cycling. So you're yeah. Uh, it, it really gives you that mental clarity that you'll need to be productive. So I really like that. So the next- on, the week, on a weekday, you want to go to a path where there are other cyclists. That's what I do. Because um, I count how many people I pass. And on any ride, I have to be net positive. I would <laughs> never let more people pass me than I actually have passed. The competitive. So the road is going to be a tough one because I, I will not let anyone pass me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's anal but but you asked me how i get fuel in the morning and that's what i do oh i love it i if love running, it now with technology you know that you know your pace is off by two seconds and so yeah so that to me i always say you know i i like to cycle to work and i don't cycle competitively to work i just take one of the um, bikes that you basically rent and you cycle down yeah. and even then i'm, I'm i've caught myself with like they pass me <laughs> and, and they're, they're on a 10 speed bike and i'm on, you know, on my uh three dollar cruiser ride and i still get upset but you know i always tell myself don't get a cup of coffee to the, the office because the ride awakens you that's the other piece that i love about this which is the process of awakening it's a it's a massively invigorating thing De- definitely and which really ties into being competitive because i'm like that i I've played men, like soccer my whole life, rugby. Now I do half marathons and I, I'm a, I wake up early. I do meditation and, and it's, it's really hard. It's in me. I can't, I can't change it. But then I heard this quote by Tony Robbins, which blew my mind. And it says, I used to achieve to be happy. Now I happily achieve. And as someone who has achieved so much professionally and being so competitive, which I think, again, has contributed to having achieved so much, what drives you today? And how do you make sure the ride is still enjoyable, regardless of the, of the outcome? And, and what I mean by that is, let's say you have a huge goal for the end of the year. How do you make sure that your mood throughout the year doesn't depend just on that goal, that, that you actually have other things that bring you joy and satisfaction throughout the year, as opposed to just deriving happiness from winning the race or from getting that trophy, which is something I have battled with. Yeah, I I believe that um, what uh, what would make me and has made me already happier in the journey is when others who are helping me achieve for our founders and shareholders and for the purpose of the company their own success because our success or my success is not individual it really relies on a lot of people so for now for myself one of the things i derive the most joy from and happily achieving as you call it is when i see other people you know improving other people growing other people doing things differently to get to their results other people being happier uh, that is very motivating to me. And, and you know, it's, very, it's been really interesting because when you're not together, uh, sometimes it's harder to see that, right? Yeah. You have a chance to get together, even on a tile call, um, I think is still very motivating. So for me, you know, I think as someone who has to get done so much through others, uh, a big part of happily succeeding is about seeing others succeed. And and when you do that, I think the reward will be always coming because always someone is succeeding and improving, doing something. And, and when you say something, you know, 
it's a big responsibility because people are listening. People are watching you and you have to be intentional. You can't just blow things off. You can't just be, yeah, you can be yourself and you need to be, you need to be yourself. You need to be authentic. So you have to draw on your bank of experiences to, to, to you know, make a teachable moment. Uh, but you do have to think about, you know, this person has really thought about asking me for feedback. You can't just not, not prepare and provide feedback. That is the most insincere and the most honestly irresponsible thing you could ever do. Because now someone's counting on improving and that person's part of your team and you want them to succeed. Well, you better get ready. Some of those, um, obviously, preparations, I see now as some of the most important. It's equally as important as going into an innovation meeting, into a pricing meeting, into a marketing plan meeting. Because the impact to that person who has 25 people working for her are so profound that they have more future-facing results opportunities. Yeah. I I love that. And, and it really shows your human side. It really shows that you care and and they're really going to continue to support you in, in your journey. I think that's that's fantastic. I hear some people say, if you want to be a high performer, if you want to make it to president, vice president, EVP, you need to extremely focus and be intentional. And that is always going to come at the expense of other areas in your life. Like maybe your family life will suffer, or maybe your, your physical, your fitness will suffer, or maybe your relationships, or maybe your, I don't know, your spiritual side will. Do you agree that if anything in sports, in business, if you get to a certain level, like up there, you, other areas of your life will suffer in many ways, or is it achievable to have a really good balance? Um, I think it's achievable. I also think that you fail and you learn. And I wouldn't tell you that it's been perfect for me because that would be a big lie. And so, and I have basically at times gone ahead of myself and my ambition and in the process, you know, spent less time with family um, at a time where I would have likely been better off spending more time with them. And, and you can look at that now and you can reflect on that and understand that, you know, boy, I wish I would have. And the only thing that keeps me going is I knew that I was doing my best. Uh, so my intentions were the best. I knew I had a great partner helping me. Uh, in my wife. And I knew I had great kids who were empathetic and cheering me from the sideline to go after that. So it wasn't a, you know, my goodness, you know, they were resentful that I wasn't there. But Stefan, I would have to tell you that even if all that sounds great, I sometimes have this, you know, in Spanish, the word is cargo de conciencia. Yeah. You know, this thing in the back of your head that just kind of tells you, you should have not done that, right? And so what do you do now? Well, you try to over, you know, you try to make it up. You can make it up. What you have to do is to look forward, learn from it, and just be better for it. And I'll tell you what, I tell people, you know, now that I can impart that learning, it's like, you know, when I was trying to make that choice and I was just as ambitious, I did this thing that I would tell you, you know, this is what worked. This is what I always thought may have been different so that you at least have now a more informed um, opinion for yourself and you can do what, what is best for you. These are so personal things that you do for yourself, but no one ever told me, you know, oh, doing this is going to take a toll on your family. You know why? Because they wanted me to take the job. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, and, and that's the bottom line, right? And I'm not upset at them. Uh, they they painted a picture, but I wish I would have known now what I know having gone through it. No one ever said, we know you like to do all these physical things, you know, being on a plane 75% of my time won't afford you because you cannot run up and down the plane hall. You know, it's you, the aisle is the aisle. You have to be buckled up. You can't be moving. So um, anyway, yeah. So I, I think it can be done. I think. You have to be very, very deliberate about recognizing as much as you can the trade-offs. These are all trade-offs. 
And if you can accept the trade-off and look at yourself in the mirror and say, in five years, I'm going to look back and I would have done it with my best of intentions and I will have no remorse. Great. Keep going. Yeah, I think you're you're right. Like we do what we can with what we have in specific times and then you'll look back and then maybe have some regrets or not. But like Steve Jobs said, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And if, if, if you can't just see magically what's going to happen. So I, I totally understand you. And, and, and to your topic about it, maybe it'll be at the expense of the family. My, my wife and I, my wife and I are new parents. We have a one-year-old, his name is Liam. And, and I really, commend and and recognize women mothers because my wife just went through a one-year maternity leave she she works at spin and and sometimes i see other moms and my mom and i see my dad who was actually a businessman and we that's why we moved around similar to your case but in the case of of women it it does have a big impact when they go on maternity leave it's like a year People think that it's vacation. It's not vacation. Like I've, I had to take care of my son for two weeks. It was the most, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I used to work in investments at Scotiabank for seven years. And this was three times as hard taking care of a one-year-old. Oh my God. So I know uh, big hug and, and respect for, for all professional women, because it, I know you've served on a, on a variety of boards, including Break the Ceiling, Touch the Sky, a global platform to nurture women advancement. Um, how do you think we can continue to, to bridge the gap and help women ad- advance in the, in the workplace? Well, it's uh, you have to be intentional. You have to have the courage to, be, to, to know your agenda and to express your agenda and have no fear of retribution. Right, you just have to. To me, that's so critical. Um, yeah, we're very lucky to be, you know, obviously surrounded by a lot of very, very successful women in the company, and we can always do better. That's the other thing. And so, but it starts with everything, Stefan. You know, it's like you, you get a, you, you have to hire someone, and you look at the slate, and there's not a diverse talent or a woman, and you ask yourself, why not? And until you have that, you don't have a slate. And so, before you choose, make sure you have you know, what you're looking for, if you really are intentional. The second thing is that it's not just about bringing, you know, talent in a company and engaging them, but over time, they also have to progress. And and so to me, that's the area where I believe uh, many companies can do better. So, you know, progression is critical. So you you can't just say I'm 61% women, if that's what you want to do from a gender, you know, benchmark perspective. You also have to look at women representation um, in the company through levels, uh, including all the way to the board. Uh, And so I think this takes a lot of work. And then you also have to take into account unconscious bias. You also have to take into account the fact that you need allies. You know, this is one of the things that, you know, it's not just about preaching. You have to help. To help, you have to educate. To educate, you have to have people who want to do it. So you have to build allies who yes. want to do it as well. And oftentimes, allies could be men, right? Or could be partners or could be others who just want to join in the, let's do this for our own good and for, for everyone's benefit and are inclusive and get it. We also have to recognize that, to your point, you know, going on a maternity leave or a paternity leave of absence or a leave is important to know how to support. And, you know, I've been in situations where you would say someone's leaving an amazing post and that amazing post is a crucible job, meaning is a job that leads to advancement. And and this person, you know, sometimes you control when you're going to have your your child and someone, sometimes you don't have that control because it just happens and it's a beautiful thing. So guess what? You hold the position for that person. And that's when you know you have a culture that has embraced this and wants to do it. So that's what this effort is really all about. It's about educating. It's about sharing best practices. Uh, it's about basically providing, you know, other places um, for women to network in the case of Touch the Ceiling, Break the Sky. There are many other affinity groups that would have similar objectives. 
and the principles may travel so uh, thank you that that means a lot to to my wife and and to women everywhere especially latino women who who um who are listening to this podcast we're coming almost towards the end of the of the interview max now it's the rapid fire question section very simple you already know these answers i haven't given you the questions but they're very easy so maybe a little harder but rapid fire you can take 10 15 20 seconds here we go name one thing you have done in the past three months that makes you proud I actually came to an in-person graduation for my daughter, uh, which I thought I couldn't do because of all the travel restrictions. But it was a very proud moment because she worked so hard and in this, you know, in these conditions for her to have accomplished that. Uh, I couldn't but be there for her. So uh, makes me very proud. Fantastic. What's her what's her name and what did she study? Jackie. Uh, her name is ja Jackie, Jacqueline, and she finished her master's degree in mental health. Oof, I love that. She does the breath work. That's Jackie, right? No, so she's going to be trying to orient her uh, specialty to athletes and to sports. Oh, I love that. Okay. As you have gotten older, what has become increasingly important? To get white hair. <laughs> I love that. Okay. If you could invite three people, living or dead, to your home for dinner, who would they be? Um, so my grandfather, um, my paternal grandfather, for sure. Uh, my father-in-law, uh, they both passed away. And um, um, just the two of them. Love so, it. Yeah. If you could study with any expert in the world, who would you work with and what would you study? If I could study with anyone or anything? Any expert, yeah. With any expert in the world, what would you, who would you work with and what would you study? I, that person. I would basically be very intentional about studying philosophy. And before I actually answer who the expert is, I would have to go do some research. But I believe that this is such an important thing, and I believe I'm so underdeveloped, and I always wish I would know more about it. I love it. Complete the following phrase. I lose track of time when I... Blank. I'm cycling. Sorry? When I'm cycling. Nice. If you had to give up what you do professionally, what would you do instead? I would coach people. Like sports or mental? Anything, whatever they want. Nice. What do you consider your top non-business achievement? My family. Love it. What are two to three things you've always wanted to do? These could be things on your bucket list. You know what? I need to go to Greece uh, with my wife. It's been her bucket list and I've let her down and I kind of want to do it. So we got it. We have to go to Greece. Um, I I want to get back to uh, I want to I want to just go cook more. And I love to cook. And uh, obviously, the busier you get, the less you do it. But I want to cook more. And uh, and I love I love to do it. So um, and then and that's simple. Right. So I, I shouldn't be thinking that of a bucket list. but it just gives me tremendous joy. So, uh, and, and you are then, Peruvian, great cook. Yes, sensor. exactly. And you know what? I want to go back to Africa. Um, I, I think my time in Africa was very, very um, limited. And I believe that I want to go back with an eye towards really helping. Um, I don't know what that means. Other than when I was there, I saw so much need. And there's nothing, I mean, it, in in life, People make an impression on you, and I cannot begin to tell you that I, I can visualize the faces of children that would look at me as I walked different areas. And I went to really very, very poor, very, you know, underdeveloped places. What in, countries? In, 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 in Africa, in, in a few of the African places, particularly in the South, and their faces are imprints in my in my memory uh, because you could tell they were telling you help me or 
talk to me or do something with me. And I, I didn't because I wasn't there to do that. And I wish I could have. And so, uh, yeah. Which ties perfectly to the next question. I know you may not know, but if you could start a char- charitable organization, what would be the cause? Um, I think it would be mental health. Um, I've seen, you know, I've seen this, uh, and it's becoming more, more pronouncedly uh, in everyday life. That I think, you know, if I can give back, I mean, I've been lucky enough, and but I've seen it. That I would basically do something along those lines. I love it. Three more quick questions, and then the final blockbuster question: What book have you recommended most to others? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, I have it right there. That's that's my next book. I love it. Okay. What are three things you believe you need to be happy? Um, you need to love yourself first. So uh, in order to be happy, you have to be happy with yourself, in my opinion. Uh, second, you have to surround yourself with people who are happy. And then third, you really have to go through life just knowing that you're doing something that you meant to do. And sometimes, you know, to me, that makes me happy that, okay, even if it was a mistake, I meant to do it and it didn't work. But you know what? I tried. And so on to the next thing. Oh, I love that. And the last, the next one here could be tied to the last one. But if you could only give one advice to your three kids, what would that be? I, I would tell them to, to do for themselves what they think is best for themselves. I have my dad when I was you know, leaving college, uh, was starting up his business. And I helped him with one part of the business, um, which is today, which was until recently, it's still a big part of the business. And he said to me, you don't have to work for me. You don't have to work with me. You go do what you want to do. And it was so liberating. I cried from my home to the airport before I left to my first job. And, but I became the person I am. And so I wish my kids to never look to what I've done and to do for themselves what they want to do for themselves so they can be happy. That's beautiful. I, I, I think it means a lot to them because it really ties well with authenticity to, to being themselves. And that, that means a lot because then you're not operating under the shadow of, of, a, of someone who's accomplished so much. Even I sometimes feel like, Oh my God, my dad, maybe I, I should have done something similar. I, when I quit my bank job, maybe I shouldn't have, you know, but, but I love that because at the end of the day, it seems cheesy, but you only have one life. You might as well spend it doing something you love and, and being yourself, living your authentic truth. The final question that we call the champagne question. Every guest gets this question and it's the champagne question. And it goes like this. If we were to meet a year from now with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating in Max Rangel's life? I would celebrate that I've been in Toronto for over a year and all my colleagues and I are closer. The city has reopened. We all are, you know, engaging. Um, So very professionally, you know, I love what I'm doing. I love my company. Uh, I love our outlook. And so to me, that's very motivating. And I wish that at the same time, surrounding me would be my wife and kids. Because I think, you know, they're saying, go, go do this. This is your your dream. And so it'd be great if they could be there. Yeah, to, to be cheering you from the sidelines as they have always done, which, which I know means a lot to you. And I think by then they won't have to quarantine two weeks. So they can come have champagne and go back. So... <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I heard yesterday on the news that if you, if the, maybe if you have the two shots, you won't need to quarantine anymore. So yeah. I, I hope that Listen, I'm incredibly respectful of what the, the country is doing. And, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, you know, 400 under 500. That's terrific. I mean, that's exactly what this is about. Um, but boy, does it hurt me that, you know, they just can't come and leave, you know, and, and they're, they're now working like you. So they're now professionals. They can't just take three weeks. They have to go back to work. So yeah. uh, uh, anyway, 
Exactly. Well, my friend, uh, Max, thank you so much for, for taking a time out of your busy schedule. It, it really means a lot to me and, and trust me to, to the listeners of the podcast, you being Latino, you being so kind, you, you, you sharing, as I said, success leaves clues. And, and I love it so much when someone or people who accomplish great things they don't do it at the expense of their essence and of their authenticity. And you're, you're super kind, you're super authentic, you're super uh, like an incredible person. So I'm so happy that so many great things have happened to you and that you will continue to achieve great things. Good luck with, uh, with, your, with your company, with your family, with everything you're doing. And uh, thank you, thank you very much again. Thanks for having me. It's uh, obviously, you know, I look forward to spending time with you in the city. And, and so we'll go laugh and, uh, and and I look forward to that. So, yeah, well, you got to come to one of my comedy shows. I'll let you know I've once I've seen, I've seen them on YouTube. Now I have to see them live. <laughs> love it. Love it. Sounds great. Uh, you will get front row and I promise I won't uh, pick on you. <laughs> you can by the way and i know just make sure you bring your venezuelan story to the to the show that i go to because i love it <laughs> <laughs> my friend that's right stefan dyer max rangel on the stefan dyer podcast ciao ciao yeah. ciao gracias por escuchar el stefan dyer podcast arrivederci my people